This is Professor Sid Morris, the author of the online book Topology Without Tears, which is available from the website www.topologywithouttears.net and it is free of charge. This is video 4B, the second in the series of videos on writing proofs in mathematics. In video 4A, we discussed the term proof as it is used in mathematics and contrasted it with the way the term proof is used in everyday language and by lawyers and by scientists. So it is very important that you understand how the term proof is used in mathematics. Our aim in this video is to reinforce what was taught in video 4A. You should be able to recognise what is a proof. And in particular, you should be able to start a proof. Never again should you have to say, I don't know how to start the proof. So let us recall what a proof looks like from video 4A. A proof should start with the facts that we are given. A proof should end with what we are required to prove. In between these two, there should be a series of sentences, each with a subject and a verb. So every proof consists of statements which we are given or which are deduced from what we are given using logic or previously proved lemmas, propositions or theorems. So let us now recall what are the steps in writing a proof in pure mathematics. Step 1. Write down what we are given. Step 2. Write down the definition of each technical term in what we are given. Step 3. Write down what we are required to prove. Step 4. Write down the definition of each technical term in what we are required to prove. And step 5 is to think. So now let us consider an example. Prove that a topological space is discrete if every subset is closed. Step 1 asks us to write down what we are given. So what we are given is X tor is a topological space such that each subset of X is a closed set in X tor. Step 2 says to write down the definition of each technical term in what we are given. So the technical term is closed set. A subset of a topological space is said to be closed if its complement, that is x minus s, is in tall, that is, is an open set. Step 3 asks us to write down what we are required to prove. We are required to prove that X tor is a discrete space. Step 4 asks us to write down the definition of each technical term 
in what we are required to prove. The technical term is discrete space. A topological space, X tor, is said to be discrete if every subset T of X is a member of tor. Now we have to think, let T be any subset of X. What we are required to prove is T belongs to Tor. Well, the set S equals X minus T is a subset of X. By what we are given, this implies that S equals X minus T is a closed set in X tor. But recall, by the definition of a closed set, this implies that X minus S is in tor. But what is X minus S? X minus S is X minus X minus T, and the complement of a complement is the set of itself. So in other words, X minus S equals T. So now we have that T is in Tor, and that's exactly what we are required to prove. And so X Tor is indeed a discrete space. So the proof required us to apply each one of the steps. At some point you have to think and what you think about is how to relate what you are required to prove with what you are given. By writing these out in detail and writing out the technical definitions for each term, this usually just falls into place for simple examples. So that is another example of how you apply the steps to obtain a proof. Note that at each stage we wrote a sentence. I now want to point out to you a technique in problem solving which is very obvious once you have seen it. But maybe you don't think about it in advance. And I want to tell you about it by giving you a story. The story is I had a group of students in front of me and I asked them first how to make a cup of tea. And I gave them various ingredients. These ingredients were a, uh, a uh, cold water tap, a kettle, a gas stove, some matches, a cup and saucer, and tea, and a teapot. And I asked them how to use those ingredients to make a cup of tea. And most of them got this perfectly correct, namely put some water from the cold water tap in the kettle, light the gas on the stove, put the kettle on the gas, and when the kettle is boiled, put tea in the teapot, pour hot water from the kettle on the tea, let the tea stand for a little while, and then pour the tea 
into the cup and saucer. So far, so good. Now I said, here is a second problem. This time, you have all of the same ingredients as before, except in the kettle there is boiling water. How do you make the cup of tea? Most of them said, well, you put tea in the teapot, pour the hot water over the tea, let the tea stand for a while, and then pour the tea into the cup and saucer. And I said, that's wrong. That's not how a mathematician should solve that problem. What the mathematician should do is say, aha, this reminds me of the last problem on making a cup of tea. So all I need to do is pour the hot water down the sink, get rid of it. Now I put cold water into the kettle and I've got the problem that I've already solved. So you may think it is pretty stupid when you already have boiling water to throw it out and start again. But in fact, it is an important principle in problem solving. What you should always try to do is reduce a problem that you are given to one that you have already solved. So whenever you have a problem to solve, think about whether it reminds you of another problem you have already solved. And if it does, see if you can convert the new problem into the old problem. So there's the technique of problem solving. It's to reduce a new problem to one that you've already solved. Even if the problem that you've already solved is more complicated, the fact that you've already solved it makes solving the new problem easier. I hope you will remember this and apply this technique. In future videos, we shall be introducing another technique for writing proofs, namely that of proof by contradiction, which in certain circumstances is very useful. Thank you.